So what did we do? We set out um, to do a number of things. By way of context, it's also important that it, to, to mention that in addition to these, this period of increasing, in, in increasing number of very impactful um, incidents, we also were on a steady decline in terms of many of our other performance statistics. Our delays had been steadily worsening year over, month over month really, but year over year. Our on-time performance had been steadily worsening. Our weight assessment was also showing a worsening trend. This was a fairly steady um, period, or a fairly steady trend leading up to this period. Then on top of that steady trend of decline, we had these very significant and impactful incidents, which led to the culmination of the, the point in mid-17 when we declared the state of crisis for the system. So the seven, in July of 17, we created the Subway Action Plan. And the Subway Action Plan was designed to do two things. Number one, it was designed to arrest the decline in reliability, to stabilize the system. There's been a lot of talk about the stabilization of the system. Um, and number two, to lay the foundation for the long-term modernization of the system. So specifically, what did we set out to do? Number one, to arrest the decline in service reliability. Two, to dramatically improve customer communications, recognizing that we might not be able to stop incidents from happening, but we were committed to finding ways to share the best information we had with customers as soon as we have it. Um, three, this is an important one. Improve the way we work. The Subway Action Plan wasn't just about clearing defects and doing a surge of activity. It was also about finding new ways to do our more business, being more productive in everything that we do in ways that would, that would certainly extend beyond, um, beyond the period, of the, the one or two year period. And, and number four, to restore confidence in the system. And it, I spoke at the, at the board meeting about um, how our employees felt during this time. And it was, um, it, it's a very, it was a very difficult time for the employee base because we recognized that we weren't, um, we weren't succeeding. We recognized that our customers lost confidence in the system. And it's a system that we are so incredibly dedicated um, to. So people make so many personal sacrifices um, just repeatedly in the, with the employees, the types of the types of hours they work, the types of conditions they endure, people really working hard all the time to do the best that they can for the system, um, and to know that we lost our customers' confidence in '17 um, was a difficult time for, for for the property too. And um, and just as I said in, in the meeting on Monday, I think a lot of what we have accomplished. Over, um, over the last year is a reflection of our employees' ability um, and strength in a time of crisis to step in and to do things um, in, in new and different and better ways um, and to really be committed to, to improving the system. So we set out to do an unprecedented amount of work in the system um, to, to stabilize the system, right, to get at that to arrest the decline in reliability, to address the factors that, that, um, that are causing incidents, the underlying factors that were causing incidents on the right of way, and then also to respond and clear incidents faster when they happen. So as I mentioned before, this is a tremendous um, outpouring of effort um, and work from our workforce, and literally was something that ten th tens of thousands of people throughout the organization worked toward. Not, not just people who are in core operating positions in subways, but also our human resources personnel had to figure out ways to onboard employees faster. Our procurement <coughs> personnel had to figure out ways to uh, purchase things faster, how to get additional material and additional supplies for this elevated level of work. Um, many different aspects of the organization, everyone really stepped up. And um, in this way, I think it's definitely you know, something that we can, we can be proud of in an organization like ours. So specifically, what did we do um, in terms of stabilizing the system? One of the big things that we went after was water in the system. So water in the system causes lots of problems for our infrastructure, right? whether it's track, signals, power, um, 
the stations themselves, the tunnels themselves. Um, the, the infiltration of water creates a lot of performance problems for us. We sealed over 2,000 leaks in the system. Uh, we cleared over 340 miles of drain <coughs> in, in the, um, on the train lines themselves. Tremendous amount of work, literally clearing drains with, um, with equipment and then also uh, just with manual clearing of drains. Tremendous amount of work. Um, and then we cleared the, the debris from, the, uh, from 31,000 street grades. And we did that using these trucks, these high power trucks that we would bring in, high power vacuum trucks with big hoses. We could stick them into the grades and actually clear out those, those grades. Also, 31,000 times over a tremendous amount of work. Call was coins. Yes. Somebody, somebody got really big. <laughs> this is a chemical grouting operation, this picture. You can see this is an example of what we do. We actually go into the, the tunnel ceiling and shoot grout um, into, into areas of the ceiling or areas of, of the wall where we have water. Um, of course, we're underground, so water's going to come, it's going to go somewhere. So what we do is we try to isolate our grouting applications to places where we know the water's particularly problematic. So if there's signal equipment under here or some sort of junction box, we're going to try and route the water around that. Track cleaning. A big focus of subway action plan. So we cleaned over 285 miles of track, um, not just the station track, but the tracks in between the stations as well. Um, and we have 10 of these new mobile backs that we purchased. Um, these were specially designed for our conditions. They move around on a flat um, behind a work train, or actually we can also put them in a revenue train. We can isolate a car and put them in a, in a revenue train too. Uh, and basically from the platform, the hose extends down for high-powered vacuuming, um, but, but aided with a manual crew. Track maintenance was a big, um, a big focus of the program. We cleared 60% more defects over the last, over the year, year of SAP, first year of SAP, um, than we cleared on an average leading up to this, to this period. Um, I think normally we get to, in recent years since we've stepped up our um, defect, we've about 8,000. So 60% more defects were cleared in this 12 month period. Um, again, just by getting out, getting more work done, looking for, for better, faster ways of doing work, and also onboarding more track staff. We installed 100,000 friction pads. That's triple our normal rate of, of friction pad installation. Those are pads that sit between the, the rail and the, and, and the plate and give the, um, the rail some more resiliency in terms of vibration. Signals. We worked on over 11,000 signal locations in the system. So literally inspected every signal in the system. Six, over 660 miles of track. Um, went out there and did inspections of all of, of, um, of that equipment. We modernized 150 Signal stops from an induction style to a capacitor style. Um, we have insulated joints that we clean with new magnetic wands. I don't know if you've seen this. We do this. There was some news coverage of those. I saw it. Yes. <laughs> I saw it the other day. You saw, you saw it out there? 2,500 um, pounds, over 2,500 pounds of debris that were removed <laughs> from, from the joints of rails. Right? Wow. So again, anything that's in any <clears throat> sliver, any sort of debris that can get into that joint, can cause a break in the circuit, which can cause our signals to fail. They fail safe, but fail, essentially stop our train service. So we've been able to pull all of that debris out through this exercise, which continues today. Um, air switches. So pneumatic switches are some of our oldest switches in the system. We focused on them, this is the full population of them, 772, we did special inspections, opened the machine case up, uh, replaced components. We cleared over 1,300 outstanding defects in signals. And today, we're doing more inspections, more maintenance, more corrective repair. We're doing it in a very focused way. We're looking at the ones, the, the, the specific locations that are failing the most, or the specific locations that are the most um, impactful to service. And making sure that we get to those either more regularly on the PM cycle, the preventative maintenance cycle, or that we're actually making sure we make the fixes where they need to be made. Is this the huge explosion in what they're now reporting as 
signals, I mean, I'm sorry, no, never mind. Go ahead. It's the safety brakes. When they say yeah. that the brakes have been activated, yeah. which I think all of us assume means someone pulled the cord, but it now sounds like it's a totally separate process. So, so it has a, it's called brakes in emergency, and you're right, we message it now as the train's brakes have been automatically activated. Yes. Right? That's the message that we see. And it feels like that's happening a lot more because we're getting that message a lot more. Um, in reality, that I believe is more of a messaging piece that we're using that term. But essentially what that means, it can, it can cover any number of things. Um, when a train's brakes are automatically activated, we call it a BIE, a brakes in emergency. It could be that there was some debris on the right of way and it hit the tripping device that hangs off the car, right? And that will cause the brakes to go into emergency. Um, it could be that there's something malfunctioning with the signaling system, and it's not that the stop arm isn't clearing, which is what's causing the, the train to go into emergency. Um, it could be that there was some sort of power blip or some sort of issue that also just caused the signal not to function appropriately. Gremlins. It always gremlins. It always fails safe, but we have an, we have an inspection protocol where the train operator, if they don't know what happened, the train operator goes down to the roadbed to see to inspect the roadbed, which can take time. It used to take hours. It should I mean, take hours. No, no, no. I used to. Used to. Okay, well, I would say yeah, like the 15 inspection years could take ago. hours. What they find could take hours, depending on what it is. It is possible it could be a rail condition or something like that that has to be addressed immediately and the train can't move. Um, most often it's a piece of debris or nothing that can be found immediately. Um, most often it sort of falls into one of those two categories. Well, I should say far more debris than nothing. But, what, but out of an abundance of caution, that's the procedure that we have in place. But I agree it's frustrating and we're looking for ways to streamline that inspection procedure so that we can get it done faster. Because when we have a BIE with no notice, trains essentially are stopped in their, on their tracks. The engineer has to look entirely from the train back. Depends on what they find. Yeah. Right? So it also depends on the equipment. So some of our newer trains will actually say where the where the brake activation mm -hmm. was. So it gives them a clue. They can go to that location. If there's something there, they can they can free it and move right on. Also gives you an indication as to where you might look, where you might focus your your, your investigation. So if if it's something on the track, and they can get at it, they can just take that leaf off our, or whatever. Yes, yes. Our train operators do amazing things. They will wrestle stuff out from under the train. I mean, I remember recently like hearing they found like a baby mattress, a crib mattress, and some train operator <laughs> pulled it out from under the train and put it in the operating cabin. You couldn't figure out what else to do with it. You want to leave it out on the roadbed. I mean, really amazing stories. Uh, Bicycles. <laughs> what is a gear switch? Gear switch. Gear switch. Oh, gear switch? I was going to say, I couldn't because I don't know what a gear switch is. An air switch, so it's a pneumatic switch. It's an actual switch that moves, 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 the, yeah, moves the, um, the, the, the switch of the track, the special work of the track. But it's an old model that's powered by air lines. It's pneumatically powered. Um, and, and it's prone to problems with those types of airlines, the, the seals, the gaskets, all the things, all the, the equipment that sort of go around there. Yeah, it's 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 older. So we went in and we changed all of that equipment out, all of those accessories out, I should say. Yeah. Anything else on this one? All right, moving on. Continuous welded rail. So continuous welded rail yes. is something that we um, installed intensively over the last two years. It's something that we have been doing before, but we significantly stepped it up over the course of SEP. So what CWR is, is essentially a long string of rail that takes the place of multiple strings of rail that are bolted together, multiple smaller strings. So our, three, our CWR comes in 390 foot segments, strings of, of, of rail. It takes the place of 10 39 foot pieces of rail. And formerly, each of those 39 foot pieces of rail was bolted together. So I'm sure, you know, when you're traveling, sometimes you, you hear it going over yeah. bolted rail, the clickety clap, right? So replacing with CWR gives riders a smoother ride, makes it quieter, but it also does a lot for the health of the track and the rail system. 
those joints are the point, the most common point of failure on the on a rail. So by installing CWR and getting rid of that jointed rail, you're essentially taking out that vulnerability for those points. You're also making things easier on the track system and on the, the trucks of, of the car. The car you know, they're, they're bouncing around with those joints as well. So putting less wear and tear on our infrastructure um, and giving, you know, giving folks a, a smoother ride and um, giving the, the, the rail itself um, a better, better state of, um, of good repair. So this map here shows the blue lines are everywhere that we install CWR in 17 and 18. Very aggressive installation. Yeah. Why did you pick those sub locations? Well, those locations, oh, let me show you this map. This blue territory is everywhere where we have CWR in the system. The red segments are the only segments that remain in the system where we can put it. So we can't put CWR on our elevated tracks and stuff on the structures, and we can't put it where our, we have very tight curves. So essentially, we've gotten to almost all the system. So we, this was, this it basically was what was left. And that's why we went after it and we said we're going we're to get to nearly the entire system over the course of this, of this campaign. Um, do you have enough representation how many joints you remove? Because if those are weak points in the system, that's a great point. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. I don't know. I don't have that. No, I mean, that's <laughs> but it does seem like logically we should be able to at least estimate it, right? Yeah. The other thing that we do when we when we install CWR is we don't joint the ends of the 390 foot piece. We actually do what's called a boute weld. We weld it on the site. So we're welding the whole segment, including the end. Isn't there a cost saving also involved in doing this in the long run? Even though it may oh, initially, if, if you could, I, I, I'm giving you a leading question because I know the answer, but maybe yeah. you can explain to everybody yeah. else how it does eventually save money. Thanks. Um, yes, so the less wear and tear that we put on our trucks, the less wear and tear that we put on our tracks, the less defects that we have on our rails themselves save us a tremendous amount in terms of maintenance, in terms of corrective work that we need to do. So these are definitely investments that are improving the state of the system right now and making it more maintainable, more cost effective to maintain it and, and keep it in good repair moving forward. Absolutely. And um, the other image showed, showed a string actually being installed. We've recently rolled out a new piece of technology called the, crit called the Critter. <laughs> Then it gets harder. We have the fire machine to find on there? Yeah, I just, yeah. Okay. I was yeah. just going to, this machine I, is now a mechanized way of laying that, that CWR out. We just started using this machine in the last couple of years. It mm -hmm. takes the place of, we used to line up, I think, 27 people to pick up one of these heavy pieces of rail, 390 foot pieces of rail. So we've been able to not just cut down on the labor with installing this, but to be able to do it faster and to be able to do it much safer. As you can imagine, that's a point of injury for people. Do we have only one? I think we have a couple of them now. Yeah. Sally, how long does it, uh, a piece of continuous welded rail last? I think it's about 40 years. Yeah, 30, 40 years. That's and that's longer than the 10 jointed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but I, those, are, those are good questions. I'll get those, those data points because I think those are really helpful for all of us to have the tips of our fingers. Yeah. And just another data point: if you have um, how long and the cost of the old way versus with this yeah. mach machine, you can also help us make the case of yeah. efficiency. Yeah, Ella, thank you. Yeah, that's what I was bringing up. That if they size everything else. It also saves money, it's which is why everybody in this age of, you know, right. prayer is going on. What are, what are they doing to save money? So this is, this has multitudinous good things. Multitudinous, whatever the word is. Yes, a lot. A, a lot of good things. Yep. <laughs> good. Just, just as clarification, you all these tracks, you're doing all the tracks in your location. All four tracks, four tracks. Um, I, I think in some territories it's 
possible that we were just doing remaining tracks? I mean, we're doing we're doing both rails on a track, but, we, but it may be that we had CWR in one direction, but not in the other direction. We've been shipping away. So we're fully facility. We have it on both directions. Yes. Yes. Yep. We are, the only places we don't have it where we can have it are these are these small segments. Yeah. I don't think there's any red hiding under the blue. That's the question. Yeah. But it is on some elevator. It's on a lot of different changes. Elevator. The elevator. That's not elevator. Rockaway Branch is not partially elevated. Yeah. It's it's, it's silent. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the. It's on the uh, water. Categorization. Kind of it's semantics. Of, yeah. yeah. How do you ship? I mean, how does this get here? I mean, I'm on the I'm I'm, I'm by the GW. So all these huge things come in, like subway cars, yeah. wrapped in plastic, right. etc. And you know these great big old things. How does this physically get delivered to New York yeah. and get underground? Okay, so I don't know. That's oh. I don't know. Okay, sorry. It's a short answer, but I will say that I do believe some of the welding to create these strings happens on our on at our facility. So oh, we don't that was, necessarily that have sense. it delivered okay. as 390 foot segments. But we do have long segments on the Yeah. I mean, I'm like envisioning the spaghetti tray. It's, yeah. We, we are positioned <laughs> here, so it's entirely possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um, it, you, it seems like you have a heat map or something of where the rail problems have been, like the, the before, after yeah. sort of thing. Is that, uh, especially going through the winter as the temperature? Right. Yeah, we're, we're working on that. Yeah, we're working on pulling it together. Yeah, I agree. That would be a very good, um, good and dramatic vision. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so um, I already talked about signals, but here's just a couple of pictures which are really very compelling. So here, you know, this is, a, this is a, a signal junction box, a circuit junction box that had been damaged in a fire. We were still running service. This is, a, this is on the 53rd Street line at 7th Avenue. Um, but we basically had lost the redundancy that this box would give us. So we were able to stall the bottom box, <laughs> get rid of the top box, thankfully, right? And, uh, and get rid of the, and install with newer um, equipment. So now we have more redundancy in that area. Here's another example. This is an old corroded power junction box um, at 179th Street. Um, I believe this one was actually um, partially corroded due to water infiltration, and what we did is we rerouted the circuitry and installed a new junction box um, at 179th Street, so that now we have this more reliable, newer feed, but also in a, in a water-safe area. Okay. You just mentioned water, and you mentioned before how you sealed these ceilings and things like that. I thought it would be more advantageous to understand where the source of water is coming from rather than put a Band-Aid on it because it's, you're, what you're doing is just putting a Band-Aid on something that is going to blow out sooner or later. Yeah, I, so it's, the, it's a huge challenge for us. I mean, we are underground, so the water is coming from everywhere. Well, I mean, uh, flowing to the, you know, sure. to the lowest place. The, the, we did um, so work with DEP to find out where this water is coming from. Yeah, we've done. We we work with with DOT quite a DOT. bit too, where we can put street furniture in that can actually raise some vents. Um, we have we on a dry day drum, uh, pump 13 million gallons of water out of the system on a dry day. <laughs> Um, it's a tremendous operation. The hydraulics operation, if you ever want an interesting presentation here, you should have a hydraulic basket. Frank is the operating officer, has a very deep background in hydraulics. So I've gotten lots of information from him, and it's fascinating what we do every day to, to just move water out of the system. Um, we know our flood-prone locations in the system. Some of them we have... Um, I would say uh, basic but very effective mechanisms for trying to, to address when we know that we're going to have heavy rains, whether it's plywood, sandbags, those things are very effective, but we can't do them everywhere. So we know something's coming through the city, we have to, you know, we have to try and isolate where those issues are. In other cases, we've raised, uh, raised the vents to try and keep the water from coming in. We have some storm doors and some different ventilation uh, or vent covers that we've now deployed post-Sandy. Uh, but we still have issues. We 
you'll know we have issues, we, you know, some of the flooding no. that happened over the last couple of weeks, we had a couple of issues with known locations where we know the water comes in. There's a flood the warning level. for tonight. What's that? We have a flood warning for tonight. Yeah, we yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're busy. Where yeah. Do you, where do you, once you, you get take the water out from the hydraulics, what do you mean dump it? We we have yeah, it goes in right into the into the, the river. Or into no, no, no. We don't take it into the river. We right. You don't. They, they can't put it in the river. Into the, yeah. the drains on the into the yeah the drains. And then it goes into the sewage 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 water. 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 But it, yeah. that could overflow also. Yes, it does. Could, so, so what we see now, since we've done all of our drain cleaning uh, efforts over SAP, is our drains are doing what they're supposed to do. They're they're taking the water out, right? So it used to be we would have these known flooding locations. Water would come in, right? If we see the images on you know on social media, there's stations where the water comes in, falls to the track, and it would pull up. It would create track circuits, or it would create situations where we couldn't pass, and service would stop. So in all of these isolated rainstorms that we've had over the last year we have that hasn't happened i think it happened to actually it did happen on, uh, about the other no, the other day 28th street on the uh, sea was out but that was, was bypassing it it was rain platform. coming in that was because of the platform but the, the right. trains are doing their job so our what we've been doing is clearing that drain out because as you can imagine a lot of modern mm -hmm. things that can build up in those drains we have put a huge effort into clearing those drains so that the, so that the water can move out of our stations into the broader New York City. Edith, where did you just system. say? Twenty third on the sea because actually it's one of my favorite stations. I actually got stuck there a number of years ago um, on the platform. I had like twenty various different you know uniform services there, and all I'm saying is. I just got a glass of, you know, like a bottle of water. And we, they, we just basically hung out until they felt it was safe enough to carry me up to get me out of the system, because otherwise we were just going to wait for it to drain. Right. So, the, so the, the problematic area there is actually at 34th Street, but when we have yes. to... And it runs it, down. Yeah, when we have to run express, we, you know, we end up bypassing your, the station you're talking about. So we... We know that location, the, the, the street rates, um, we haven't been able to, to bring them up. We've tried working with DOT. We have yet to really to figure out um, something that would sort of pass muster with them because it's a, very, it's a busy circulation area on the sidewalk. But if you look at images on the street level, you can see the curb is only uh, a little bit off of the street. The water just comes when it heavy, heavy rains and pours into those grates. We can't put plywood over those grates specifically because we have HVAC equipment for the facilities that are underneath the 34th Street facility. There's HVAC equipment um, right under those vents. So we, so we can't, we don't have the option there of doing that. So we're still working through that, but though that is a known issue and it's an example of, you know, Mother Nature at work, we're, we're still working on that. 23rd and 6th, the last week, I was trying to cross and it went from the water completely covered over the curbs and were like a good two feet going towards within 45 minutes it was all gone right right yeah you know, as soon as the rain stopped it took 45 and minutes and it was gone and then 31 minutes yeah we well, and there is a station can we, there can we let sally continue with her presentation i just have a question about this we're, we're, we're losing it here i just say there's so much here so one was, I remember Tom here, <laughs> look up, if it rains two inches in an hour, that's when the system has real problems. If, um, if there are as many, if you've been able to reduce hot spots from those heavy downpours, and if you have sort of what proportion of hot spots you've been able to, to make your way on, so there's fewer of them. Yeah, I don't know, I don't have the, the numbers, but I know that it's rare at this point for us to have an issue where um, where rain is stopping train service. It's not it's not um, that uncommon for us to skip a platform or to bypass a station if there's a lot of rain coming in and we think it's hazardous for people if, 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 if what the rainwater is pulling. But on the track level, we did have the disruption on the sixth line in July. Um, mm -hmm. It feels like it was longer than that. The time was, very was very slowly for me, actually. So, yeah, so I think it was July. It feels like it was a long time ago. Um, 
but that was actually one where we had a tremendous amount of water come in. The drain itself was fine, but it carried the water carried a lot of debris with it, and it just immediately clogged up the the, over, the, the, the period over the drain or the, the area over the drain. So we had to go in and essentially pull that debris out at the same time the water was flooding it. So that was a, but again, it wasn't the drain system itself that wasn't working. Uh, Sally, I have a question. Yes. Um, so here you've cleaned all these drains. What, what are you doing moving forward to keep them clean? Is there a strategy to, yeah. to I mean, it's state, to continue state of good repair, to, yes. to keep them, I mean, do you have a plan to then go back to where you started cleaning the drains, or right. how does that work? Yeah, so we haven't worked through all the specifics yet, but in each case, in each, in each area here, we've had a surge of activity, um, to essentially catch up on things that, that hadn't been done, um, or defects that had risen faster than we were able to clear them. So we've had this surge of activity to catch up. We had some baseline operation already in place pre-SAP, so what we are looking to do now is we're revisiting those baseline operations and figuring out how to augment them in strategic ways that doesn't necessarily have to be at the surge level, but has to be above where you know the, the level that it was pre-surge so that we can make, make sure that we're at a rate that's maintainable moving forward. So we're in the process of working through that. We've, we've programmed some of that out for our, um, our bed cleaning, um, and we're in the process of figuring out exactly what that regimen needs to look like for the drain cleaning, and whether it's going to involve the mechanized equipment or whether there's something that we can do with our in-house forces. Because this, this is a lot of the water management piece was contracted work, too. We are working with contractors to clear these drains out. Speaking of rain, those just head on cars that the rains on the inside would have up so. Which are these next? The top ones. The 44s? Yeah. No, those are all the ones. Oh. Yeah. Those are a little bit the 44s. Yeah, they have yeah. I'm a big fan of those 44s out on Staten Island. So. Yeah, but even the rains on the inside would have rains outside. Yeah, but they're, they're, yeah, they're in, uh, they're old cars, <laughs> and they're going to be replaced by the 211s, but they're in, they're in pretty good shape for, uh, for their age. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we also look, we worked on cars in SAP as well. Okay. Um, we worked on cars quite a bit. So we um, overhauled over 600 cars, and we specifically did reliability focused maintenance on the car side. So we looked at our fleet, we looked at what specific failure types in which specific fleets were having an outsized impact on our MDBF, our mean distance between failure, which is our, our KPI for, for car performance. And so what we found is when we, when we did that more detailed analysis that the master controllers, you know, the, the, essentially the lever that the, the operator is pushing, uh, the master controllers and in the 160s and the power converters in the R46s were both problematic components. And so we went in and we did a, a, a specific campaign focused on those two components, those two specific fleets. And what we were able to do is improve those that component performance. We can look at MDBF on a component level too. And what we were able to, to do is we were able to improve the performance of those components by 29% and 18% respectively. Uh, we inspected all the doors on cars. Doors is a is 